Welcome to the Dr. Journal Club podcast, the show that goes under the hood of evidence-based integrative medicine. We review recent research articles, interview evidence-based medicine thought leaders, and discuss the challenges and opportunities of integrating evidence-based and integrative medicine. Continue your learning after the show at www.drjournalclub.com. Please bear in mind that this is for educational and entertainment purposes only. Talk to your doctor before making any medical decisions, changes, etc. Everything we're talking about, that's to teach you guys stuff and have fun. We are not your doctors. Also, we would love to answer your specific questions. On drjournalclub.com, you can post questions and comments for specific videos. But go ahead and email us directly at josh at drjournalclub.com. That's josh at drjournalclub.com. Send us your listener questions, and we will discuss it on our pod. All right. Hello, everybody. It's your host, Josh and Adam, on the Dr. Journal Club podcast. And today, we are going to be interviewing Ryan Wexler, the future, very very soon, in the very near future, Dr. Ryan Wexler. And we're going to be talking to him about his experience as an integrative medicine student, naturopathic medical student, who's also obsessed with research or caught the bug for research or has the uh, the phrase I love I've heard is like you've got fire in the belly for research and has done like a master's while he's done his naturopathic degree and is now going on to pursue a career in the academy in research and so we wanted to kind of get a sense of what that's like what you know the opportunities are what that could, could look like for future students etc and just get a sense of the profession and maybe integrative medicine too, as it comes to training future integrative medicine researchers, because we freaking need more of them. Yes, definitely. Thank you guys for having me. I'm excited to be here and talk to you about this. This has really uh, become my passion over the last several years, so it'll be fun to dive in and talk about um, the landscape. Awesome. Well, so Ryan, I, I met Ryan through Adam. So Adam, you guys are buddies. I think Ryan, uh, Adam also did the uh, master's and naturopathic program. So Adam, tell us a little bit about your friend Ryan and as a sort of a means to introduction and bio, and then let's just start peppering him with questions and see what the field's like these days. Yeah, sure. Ryan, I don't know if we met when we were both students, um, when I was kind of like in my last year and maybe you were uh, in your first year. Or if it was when I was a resident um, and just helping out with with teaching while at NUNM and, um, and you were a student, I think maybe it the was former, one, yeah. yeah, okay, yeah. So um, I think one thing that we need, we need to kind of um, address too is the fact that uh, Ryan just recently got accepted to a fantastic postdoc program, um, and I think Ryan, if if you want to share that, um, that'd be awesome. Yeah, I recently accepted a position at the Cleveland Clinic um, as a postdoctoral research fellow under Amanda Shalcross, who's also a naturopathic physician. Um, and I'll be working there with another naturopathic phys- physician, Dr. Jacob Hill. Um, so it'll be cool to have a team of MDs there because not too many places in the research world do you both get to be an MD being a scientist um, and be working on the, under another MD scientist. Um, so I'm pretty excited about that part of it. Yeah. And Ryan, I remember when you when you first started at school, it kind of and and obviously correct me if I'm wrong, but it it seemed like you kind of knew the direction that you wanted to go with from the get go, at least from the research standpoint. How did you know, one, what you wanted to study uh, and then two, how you decided on uh, the research that you did as a student at NUNM? Mm. Um, Coming into NUNM, I actually wanted to be more clinically focused than I do now. Um, My research interest existed when I came to NUNM. I was thinking probably something like a 50-50 split in terms of time, and now it's more like 80-20 science and medicine. Um, I was personally interested in both exercise and meditation and came from a research background in undergraduate uh, education that was focused in exercise physiology and biomechanics. Coming to NUNM, there was not the support for that sort of thing. So I really needed to shift my focus a lot. I remember walking into um, my mentor's office 
and kind of brainstorming some project ideas with him. And I picked the exercise ideas and I picked the meditation ideas. And he just said to me, which one do you think would be more appropriate for NUNM? <laughs> and so a lot of, uh, you know, the interest that developed after that was based on what was an appropriate fit for the institution. Um, but it was also a really good fit for me. It wasn't like I was compromising what I was interested in doing or wanting to study just because there was a... Uh, a particular right fit for the institution because it's still um, work that I really care about doing. Awesome. And then how did you, when did your sort of path kind of split into you knowing that you wanted to focus more on research than the clinical route? I think the more time I spent in medical school, the more it became clear to me that I really just like education. Um, I like being in the classroom. I am a huge nerd. I love academia. I love opportunities to learn. Um, and whenever I'm not doing that, it feels like I'm just engaging in a slower learning process than I would have the opportunity <laughs> to be if I was sitting at a computer screen um, reading and getting to learn more, watching YouTube videos, talking to people about things that think subjects that I'm unfamiliar with. So uh, it, it just kind of grew naturally. And honestly, the more time I spent in the clinic with patients, the more time I became aware that I would prefer to be doing science and learning more about these people's conditions, um, kind of behind a computer screen and being able to produce that evidence to, to help them in a different way. Um, a lot of this kind of, uh, I, I like to frame it through this example of my sister-in-law, her name is Susanna. Um, she has a thyroid condition. And I remember thinking years ago, Susanna needs a doctor to help her right now. There are a lot of Susannas in the world that need physicians that are going to be there with them day to day, month to month in order to manage their treatment. But there also needs to be people behind the scenes working to help all of the Susannas at the same time. And we, we need both of those in order to create effective systems for people to get appropriate health care. And I think I'm a more systems oriented person, so I'd rather be doing the latter. And then how did you, you know, you're, you're being a little bit humble. How did you decide on exactly what your project is and, and tell people about what was your project um, as a student? Uh, it was incredibly impressive. Not a lot of students did what, what you did with the budget that you had. And so let the audience know, you know, what, what was your project as a student? Um, at NUNM? Sure. Um, I ran a clinical trial on a mindfulness intervention for patients with radiculopathy, which is sciatica, um, radiating low back pain down the leg. Um, I chose this particular uh, study design and question because I dealt with radiculopathy for many years um, after a series of disc herniations. So it was a very personal question for me. I'm also a meditator. So combining the intervention and the patient subpopulation was very relevant. And I felt like I was able to ask research questions about that patient population that was going to be um, appropriate for them and also identify gaps in the literature because of my own experience. Uh, like you said, the, the budget was very small. Um, NUNM is a rather small institution, and there was not a ton of funding to do a project of that scale. Um, I also got the project off the ground very quickly. We, I applied for a student grant in April of 2020 and received that in September of 2020. That's just $5,000. Um, to provide some sense of scale, uh, I'm sure, as you guys know, a lot of these clinical trials are run on huge um, R01s or project grants from the NIH that can be several hundreds of thousands of dollars. Uh, my small student grant was 5000 bucks, And then later, I got a little bit of internal funding from Health Got Research Institute, the research center at NUNM. And that was another $2,000, and that was all the money we had for the entire project. So it was very bootstrapped. Um, I didn't get paid. My thesis mentor got paid through my thesis credits. The, all of the graduate students were getting paid on work study funds. The participants didn't get paid, which um, was a little bit of a challenge for this study because a lot of times in research, we incentivize participation by paying people to be engaged in the study. That wasn't something that we did. Um, and so we really 
you know, did it on the cheap. <laughs> we partnered with the Oregon Health and Science University's Spine Center and Comprehensive Pain Center to recruit most of our participants. Um, and that was an ongoing relationship and for the data collection period for over a year. So you ran basically a year long clinical trial as a student with a budget that consisted of belly button lint and paper clips. <laughs> and, and you, and you, did you get it published? Uh, I just submitted for publication actually on Saturday. Yeah. yeah the the oh. protocol was already published uh, about a year ago, April, 2022. Um, and we just submitted the first round of results, just the self-report data uh, on Saturday. So. And how many participants were in the study? 71. Um, what? Yeah. Oh, wow. Oh my yeah, gosh. So that's another thing. It's like 71 RCT on $7,000? Yes. Okay. Now I'm getting why Adam's so impressed. So it, it's really been a process for me to kind of understand the scale of that project as compared to other projects in this space because I was I just had an idea and made it happen as a student with the resources that I had. I didn't understand how big these projects can really become, the number of investigators that they normally have to involve to be successful, the amount of money that it takes to run these projects, um, the amount of money that it takes to get scientific projects done at that level is so much different because everybody is getting paid and everybody's salary comes out of the same pot. And I was running a, a study where most people weren't getting paid. In fact, almost nobody was getting paid out of the money that we had for the study. The only person that got paid from that $7,000 uh, was the mindfulness instructor. So it was done very cheap. So let me ask you, Ryan, you know, I, I remember when I went through Bastyr uh, naturopathic school as a student trying to get involved in research. And I remember being really frustrated with lots of things. And at one point I had a conversation with the director of research at the time. And I said, you know, we need to do more to get more students involved. Like, w what are we doing to engage people, teach them about research, get them excited? And the model that was explained to me was like, it was almost like this bubbling up model, which was like, well, Josh, don't worry about it. Because what happens is every once in a while, you get these amazingly motivated students like yourself, Ryan, who come to us and seek us out. And we say, okay, great. You're interested. You clearly have like the fire in the belly for research. We're going to plug you in and get you involved. And I thought, that that was actually a very inefficient use of, of resources and a way to do that. And, and we're probably missing out on a lot of future researchers that way. But what was it like for you going through it? So you're going through it maybe 10 years um, uh, after I did, uh, different school, of course. What was your experience there? Was it similar? Was there more of a formalized way of getting students interested in research and getting plugged in? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think I experienced both sides of that spectrum, actually. Uh, NUNM at the moment has a master's of research in, or master's of science in integrative medicine research. And that is designed to provide students with formal mentorship and training opportunities to become a scientist. Uh, and as much as that program exists for that purpose, it's sometimes not fulfilling it in really providing hands-on research opportunities for students. Students really have to be proactive and seeking those out. Um, because NUNM is such a small school, those opportunities are not always so easily accessible at our institution. I had a really cool opportunity in my first year at NUNM. I remember walking into Health Got Research Institute and opening the door to a room where there were a bunch of faculty meetings. Um, it was their quarterly research meeting. One of the faculty, Heather Zwicky, looked at me and she said, come in and take my seat. I'm about to step out. And all of a sudden I was <laughs> I was, I was, was a month and a half into school, just six weeks of being at this brand new institution. And all of a sudden I'm like in the, in the thick of everything going on regarding science at NUNM. Um, it was very cool. And after that meeting, I asked a couple of people about the studies that they were working on. Um, and that led to research assistantships very early at, in my career at NUNM. Um, but it required, of course, needing to take on extra work. Like people were offering these opportunities, but I was a full-time med student and a dual student in this research program. So I needed to do even more than I was already doing in order to actually get this kind of experience. Um, I think a lot of students are not that proactive about getting on new stuff. Um, I probably don't say no to 
new work as often as I should, but it's provided me with a lot of really great opportunities. And, and that was a good example. I mean, I was overwhelmed as a brand new medical student, but I knew that these were potentially really crucial opportunities for me to get involved and get experience um, being a scientist in a more formal way than I had gotten to do to that point. Uh, a lot of the, I like this kind of like bubbling up or maybe top down, like a trickle down economics in the science world, right? Like it just takes a motivated person then somehow everybody else gets it. I agree that it doesn't really work like that. Um, personally, I needed a lot of support on my project because, again, I was a medical student, um, but also I was really interested in providing learning opportunities for other students because I had more science experience coming into this program than I think most students do. And I was interested in trying to provide those opportunities for other people. So when I was bringing on research assistants, I knew these people aren't just going to be doing work for me. I am also going to have be having to provide even though I was a really, really baby scientist, I knew more than they did. So I knew I was going to be providing some level of mentorship and education about the process of science to them. Um, and I hired eight research assistants that were other graduate students from naturopathic, the naturopathic doctoral program, the Chinese medicine program, the research program, nutrition and global health, um, all to be involved in this project. And most of them were just doing it for the resume um, bullet point. But for me, it was really about providing them with an opportunity to learn about this space that most people never get to see, right? Research is kind of, uh, there's an iron curtain between the reader and this, <laughs> the iron curtain, I think is, is this white paper, this like beautiful manuscript that we produce at the end of our work when we finally get a project to the finish line. But on the other side of it, it can be really messy. And that was a valuable opportunity for me to share what that process looks like with um, some other people, uh, these graduate students. I like the idea of paying it forward. I, I, I remember talking a, to a clinical mentor of mine years ago, Eric Yarnell, who I still think so highly of. And I, I, I would call him and ask him, pepper him with all these questions. And I would always be so apologetic and feel terrible about it. And he's like, Josh, don't worry about it. You'll just pay it forward You know, when you have more clinical experience. And, and I still hear that in my mind. And when people reach out, I, I agree. I mean, I think that's that's how you pay it forward. And so I love that. Um, you know, one thing, Adam, you know, we, I don't know that I know your fire in the belly origin story. You know, we just heard Ryan's, mm -hmm. I've chatted about mine in previous episodes. Like, how did you get hooked on this? And, um, and then what was your, cause you did the same master's program. So what was, what was your story, man? Yeah. So I remember, um, first year of, of med school. Now I, I come from a exercise science background, similar to Ryan, but I didn't have any sort of research experience. Um, and so I remember some of our, you know, the first lectures uh, or lectures during that first year where we were getting some evidence-based medicine lectures from, from faculty and just, it just wasn't sticking for me. I still was just like, I don't get this whole likelihood ratio thing, odds ratio, risk reduction. What, like, what are we talking about here? Um, and then also one, um, lecture, you know, kind of motivated me and what she was saying was like, you know, oftentimes we hear um, in sort of this integrative medicine space that, oh, there's no evidence to support intervention X, Y, Z. Mm -hmm. So it's up to you guys, um, you know, as you progress through your career to get involved in research and to, to run these clinical trials and to, you know, to, to provide an evidence base. And I was like, you know, that that's a good point. Because if we're not doing it and then complaining about how people are doing research, the only other option is to do it yourself. And after that, you know, I applied to the, the Masters of Integrative Medicine program, went there and honestly didn't really know what I was doing until I was kind of in the thick of things. And still, it wasn't really until late last year, um, and I was talking with you, Josh, about this a lot of like, what what am I doing with my career type of thing of, you know, having that... that quarter life that, crisis, all that yeah, jazz. Yeah, quarter life <laughs> crisis of, of um, you know, am I doing research? Am I doing clinical? Am I doing both? But... Um, I will say this, the, the faculty at HealthGot is, is amazing, right? They're so supportive of, of all the students who come in there. I remember I had a fantastic mentor. I would just drop in, you know, randomly shoot him random emails and, you know, got responses right away and was just really supportive for, for my project. And kind of like Ryan was saying, like, it's, it's tough 
because you're learning you're learning two new completely different skills you're learning everything that about evidence-based medicine from a research standpoint and you're you have a full-time uh, you know med school load and you have clinical duties but you also have you know your research duties and um you know we had to we had to write our uh, thesis and you know you know uh, defend our thesis also with the goal of publication. And so I was like, well, if I'm going to have a thesis, what's the point? Like, what's the point of doing this if I'm not going to get a publication, right? Because that matters. Um, And so we ended up turning my thesis into a publication. I focused on the publication component first and then went back and, and, you know, finished my thesis. Um, But that was really challenging. And kind of like Ryan was saying, like, you know, if, if, there's a lot of opportunities and it's it's kind of hard to say no to them just because you get so much experience from them. So I was doing my own publication, working on my thesis, full-time med school load. Uh, and then I think I was also on one or two other projects, kind of like as a student researcher, um, doing some work study on it, but also trying to understand like, okay, what's going on in these other projects. Um, and where my sort of fire died down was kind of like Ryan was saying with this iron curtain of, all the background that goes into research of applying for grants and kind of living off of grants and, um, you know, developing a a protocol, publishing a protocol, finding the staffing for it, all these other things that go on in the background. And what I realized from a career standpoint was I love reading and critiquing manuscripts and I love writing them. I hate everything else about research. I hate, I hate developing SOP. So standing uh, standard operating procedures. I hate actually writing a protocol. You know, I hate all of like the methodological things that are super, super important. The recruitment, making sure that you have you know, like all the staffing there to sure. support. Like I, I hated doing all of it. What I loved doing was writing my actual like thesis and writing my actual publication. You know, you get kind of a high off of seeing the publication. Um, and then, you know, doing that component I liked a lot, but I loved clinic way more. I felt like I was making more of a difference in, in people's lives on a daily basis for, as, as a clinician. I really didn't feel, I still don't really feel like being a clinician like is a job almost. I feel like I just talk to people all day and help them out. Uh-huh. And then, you know, yeah. And then of course, documentation of charts, but just this pesky little thing of charting that doesn't yeah. steal the joy at all. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and, and prior auths. <laughs> prior auths. Yeah, um, if charting doesn't steal your joy, prior auths will. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and so you know, I, I did a ton of work um, as a, as a student researcher, but still didn't understand sort of the ins and outs and politics of research, and like never really felt connected to a career in research. I just couldn't grasp studying one thing and like focusing in on that one thing. Right. And I feel like that's also translated from a clinical standpoint is like why I don't specialize. It's why I love being a primary care provider is because I want to see whatever walks through that door. So you're kind of like a master or, or jack of all trade, master of none. And I found when I was doing research, there wasn't like one particular subset of research that I wanted to, you know, strictly be involved in. It's like, okay, I love cardiology, lipidology, diabetes kind of stuff, but then you have to kind of keep distilling it and distilling it and distilling it until you have figure out like what your sort of career is in research. And for me, that just never stuck. Yeah. I did ultimately get um, an offer from UC San Diego for a research position. I ended up turning down to focus on community health and, uh, you know, a a career in primary care, which has been fruitful and and has been fantastic. Um, And that was ultimately when I, you know, made my decision, which was about a year ago as to, you know, how I want that, that path to separate. But I felt like as a student, I never really knew or could not really extrapolate like how a career in research would play out. Mm -hmm. And that was something that I struggled with. And I feel like Ryan, you did a good job of kind of at least understanding that or figuring it out or knowing how to make it work. And I think um, if there's any students listening to the podcast would really would be really beneficial as to like, okay, how do you map out a career towards research as a student? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think before I answer that for myself in terms of my own experience, I just want to reflect on a couple of things that you said, Adam, Um, because there were some really uh, salient points in there as I compare it to my own experience in developing as uh, as a scientist. Um, One thing you said was how much you 
love the sitting and writing of the scientific process as compared to the design methodologically of studies. And it's interesting because we, you know, both like science, but I think we like them for different reasons because I don't really like the sitting down and writing papers too much. When I sit down to write a manuscript, I feel like, wow, I'm just recapitulating all of the work that I've been doing for so long. I already know this study in and out. Why do I need to spend this time writing it up in this extremely detailed manner so that I can send it to all of my co-authors and they're going to eviscerate it anyway? <laughs> um, I really like the, the methodology part, coming up with cool new scientific questions and ways to ask those scientific questions. And I think, like I was talking about, there's this iron curtain between the public and science, and they don't really know what goes on behind the scenes for most scientists. And so I just kind of wanted to make a point that there are different kinds of, of scientists and different reasons that scientists enjoy the scientific process. Mm -hmm. um, for some people, it's the reporting of the results and getting to write up what they did in a very elegant manner. And for other people, it's asking brand new questions. And that's what really attracted me to, to science at first, like all the way back in undergrad, was science is an opportunity to ask questions that humanity literally does not have the answer to yet. And that is a really cool concept to me, um, that we get to design a question or make an observation, right? Because a meaningful scientific question comes from a meaningful observation about something that you see in the world. And from that, we develop a, a question that turns into a hypothesis. And then eventually we go through the rigmarole of designing a formal study. But before that, it's just about being curious. And that is really what drew me to science at its core is just an opportunity to be, to be curious about the world. Um, and now I get to, to ask questions and, you know, soon be getting paid to ask questions, like I said, that humanity doesn't have the answer to. And I think that's really cool. Yeah, I think I think one thing too uh, on on that topic is it's probably also why I chose to do uh, systematic review and meta analysis as as my project and what I ended up publishing uh, was because really all I was doing is reading research, kind of critiquing it, and then saying, "Hey, here's what kind of the the summary of the evidence is," uh, and just kind of stuck with it because I didn't actually have to like really do anything formal from like you had to do for where you're trying to find like people to recruit and all these other standard operating procedures and training other people to do all these other things. It's like, no, like, you know, I could just read a paper, summarize it, quickly plug in some data that's, you know, I know what I'm looking for and then just kind of move on to the next one. So there was, it was just a more of a streamlined process and really it was just doing what I loved, which was reading it, critiquing it and then writing it. Yeah. And that's an interesting point too, because I think, um, you know, comparing, uh, myself to the both of you, it's we're doing different levels of research, different kinds of research. Um, my background, you know, now is becoming in clinical trials, and I'm interested in continuing to work on clinical trials. In fact, that's what I'll be doing at Cleveland Clinic. Um, and then you guys are very much interested in evidence review. Um, Joshua, Joshua, I think you might have like some interesting points here, probably about the difference in, you know, conducting these kinds of um, research and these levels of evidence? Yeah, I mean, I agree with, um, so Adam and I are similar in that regard, which is, so my, well, so sort of, I guess it's a little bit of a, well, it's kind of neat. I think the three of us actually present like a bunch of different parts on the spectrum on, in a few ways. So one is, you know, interested research. Adam is shifting mostly clinical. Ryan, you're shifting mostly research. I'm probably in the middle between those two, and that's my happy place. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, I, I'm not, I, I like project management and I, I like the sort of recruitment piece of things, but honestly, my passion is with evidence synthesis. And so my area of focus, so sort of the jack of all trade versus specializing, I've ended up you know, specializing in evidence synthesis and just doubling down on that. Um, so yeah, so some, some similarities, but yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm curious, Ryan, as to, you know, again, your advice for future students, because I, I think that's really important. And also, you know, one other thing maybe you could touch on, too, is this idea of, you know, 80, 20, 20, 80, 50, 50. Like we all it sounds like we all went into medical school thinking we're going to be 50, 50 researchers and clinicians. And then we found our own way. And so maybe when you answer that question for future students, maybe how do how do how do they find their own way? How do they find their healthy balance? And also the pragmatics, because it's it's hard to be 
partial. Like there are clinical jobs and there are research jobs and it's sometimes hard to to mix the two up. Yeah. Um, would it be useful at this stage to talk about my process a little bit in um, yeah. coming to Cleveland Clinic? Okay. Um, so it was a, a rather long process for me to figure out where I was going to end up next. I actually, pro- probably a year ago, I started reaching out formally to people, sending cold emails, trying to learn more about people's labs, whether or not they have um, space to bring on a uh, postdoc, because that, it was clear to me, was the next step. Um, going through this program at NUNM, becoming so interested in science, uh, it was becoming obvious to me that I really wanted to be a scientist, that I did not enjoy the clinic enough that I could do that full time and be happy. Um, so for, you know, the audience, uh, af- you know, after you get a basic training as a scientist, the next step is going and getting a postdoc position where you work under a more senior scientist and um, they're both funding you with their research. Uh, so under an administrative supplement or the um, organization has some kind of training grant from the National Institutes of Health um, so that you can continue getting training, understanding the landscape of your scientific interests, and then how you could ask relevant research questions in that space. But that was the next step for me was to figure out where I'm going for a postdoc position. So I started sending a lot of cold emails and trying to understand who in the field was doing work that was relevant to me, who is going to be interested in taking me on because they saw our interests as very aligned. Um, And like I said, that process started probably a year ago in April 2022. And in that process, I sent maybe three dozen cold emails to people at a dozen different research institutions around the country and around the world in other countries. Um, That includes Canada and Australia. (laughs) Um, And it was a really exhausting process because a lot of these people do not have easily accessible emails because they know if they do, they're going to get 5,000 emails from people (laughs) wanting to work in their labs. So you need to go track down all their publications and figure out which one they're for. Um, so in addition to the cold emails, I was also sending formal applications out. That process started in uh, early October 2022. Um, after months of sending these cold emails and waiting for these formal applications to come around, I submitted my first application for a postdoctoral position to Harvard um, o- with the Osher Integrative, uh, Integrative Medicine Research Center there in Brigham and Women's Hospital. And that was a really intense interview process. That was a literally an entire day of interviewing where they put me through five rounds of interviews. Um, and I was really sad at the time when I did not end up getting that position. And after speaking with a good friend of mine who did get the position there, it became clear to me that that was actually not going to be the best fit. Um, so I continued going through the application process. I eventually applied to the University of California, San Francisco. They have another OSHA center there. And then the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, where they do a lot of mindfulness research. And actually the um, scientists that developed the intervention that I used in my clinical trial, Mindfulness Oriented Recovery Enhancement, um, did his postdoctoral position at University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. So that was a really good fit for me, potentially. Um, And then this opportunity came along from Cleveland Clinic. And this is kind of a cool part of the field where uh, it's always evolving because there are always new scientists finishing their postdoctoral positions, becoming senior scientists, and then wanting to mentor other scientists. And that's a cool part of being a scientist is that everybody just loves what they do. It's really a passion project being a scientist. You don't do it because you make a million bucks. Um, And it's cool to work with other people that are passionate. So people are always coming along, starting new labs and wanting to work with individuals that are passionate about subjects uh, that they care about as well. So Amanda Shalcross had recently been hired um, to run this Integrative Medicine Research Institute at Cleveland Clinic. She reached out to a mentor of mine wanting to get a pulse on the upcoming uh, naturopathic scientists um, in the pipeline because she was a little bit tapped out of that and wanted to chat with somebody who maybe knew more of these developing up, up and coming scientists. My mentor forwarded that email on to me and I connected with her um, and that was a really good fit. Her and I got get along um, really well, both personally and our scientific interests are aligned. 
And that's another piece of this process that's really important because somebody is taking you under their wing as a formal mentee. So not only do you want your scientific interests to be aligned, but you also need to like them as a person (laughs) and really get along with them and, and want to be working with them for the next several years of your life. So making sure that that personal fit is good is a big part of the process. Fantastic. I love it. Love that story. And so I'm hearing a lot of a theme here of like cold calls, just like put yourself out there, put yourself out there a lot, like dozens of times and it'll, it'll pay off eventually. Um, awesome. I think this has been great. Adam, were there any other questions that you wanted to, uh, ask Ryan? I would, I mean, not necessarily ask Ryan, but, um, I would say, I think, uh, you know, as an ND student specifically, um, because the the opportunities are not as well known as let's say like MD or DO or nursing colleagues where they have, you know, there's this more institutions, more support, more funding opportunities, et cetera, et cetera, for them. Oftentimes when you apply to these postdoc uh, positions, they might say like for, you know, applicants should be like MD, DO, PhD or whatever um, type of type of training. Um, and so a lot of times I, th- I feel like ND students don't know that these opportunities exist. Um, and at least in the, in the experience that I had, um, they don't really care that you're an ND. They just want to know, like, are you interested? Are you a good candidate? Like, what, what have you done? And what's your background? Mm-hmm. Um, I remember during my interview with, with UCSD, like the fact that I was an ND didn't even come up at all. They were just like asking me about my research interests and talking about my, my resume and, and whatnot. And so, you know, I, I would just encourage any ND students who are, who are concerned of like, uh, you know, oh, am I good enough? Um, um, kind of having that sort of like ND inferiority complex. Like I would just say, get rid of it. You know, if, if you're, if you're interested, if you're passionate, if you're, if you're showing up and, um, you know, you're putting in the work, people will, will, will see it and, and, you know, those opportunities will exist. Yeah, I agree. That's been my experience as well. I, I feel like Oftentimes you'll hear, oh, there's this animus against us, but that's never been my experience. It's especially in the research world. It's just been about yeah. the research. So, well, uh, wonderful. Ryan, thank you for joining us. I feel like this was a really great conversation and hopefully our students who are listening um, get some insight into how to sort of plot out and plan out their, their future. So thank you so much for coming along. Yeah, thank you for having me. If you enjoy this podcast, chances are that one of your colleagues and friends probably would as well. Please do us a favor and let them know about the podcast. And if you have a little bit of extra time, even just a few seconds, if you could rate us and review us on Apple Podcasts or any other distributor, it would be greatly appreciated. It would mean a lot to us and help get the word out to other people that would really enjoy our content. Thank you. Hey, y'all, this is Josh. You know, we talked about some really interesting stuff today. I think one of the things we're going to do that's relevant, there is a course we have on Dr. Journal Club called the EBM Boot Camp that's really meant for clinicians to sort of help them understand how to critically evaluate the literature, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Some of the things that we've been talking about today. Go ahead and check out the show notes link. We're going to link to it directly. I think it might be of interest. Don't forget to follow us on social and interact with us on social media at Dr. Journal Club, DR Journal Club on Twitter. We're on Facebook, we're on LinkedIn, et cetera, et cetera. So please reach out to us. We always love to talk to our fans and our listeners. If you have any specific questions you'd like to ask us about research, evidence, being a clinician, et cetera, don't hesitate to ask. And then of course, if you have any topics that you'd like us to cover on the pod, please let us know as well. Thank you for listening to the Dr. Journal Club podcast the show that goes under the hood of evidence-based integrative medicine. We review recent research articles, interview evidence-based medicine thought leaders, and discuss the challenges and opportunities of integrating evidence-based and integrative medicine. Be sure to visit www.drjournalclub.com to learn more.